Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club program. My name is Ladaris Cordell. I'm a retired California Superior Court judge and your moderator for today. As the club continues to host virtual events, they're also grateful for the continued support of their members and donors. Visit commonwealthclub.org to learn about membership or support the club right now with a tax deductible gift by clicking the blue donate button on your screen. The club also thanks the Bernard Osher Foundation for supporting today's Good Lit event and Marcus Books in Oakland for being our bookstore partner. It is my pleasure to welcome Annette Gordon-Reed, author of On Juneteenth. On Juneteenth. Annette is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian and Carl M. Loeb professor at Harvard University. The story of Juneteenth is an integral part of American history. As a Texas native and descendant of enslaved people brought to Texas as early as the 1820s, Annette chronicles our country's long and ongoing journey to ensure freedom and equality for all. And just a reminder, if you have a question for Professor Gordon Reed, please submit those in the chat and I'll do my best to include them in our conversation. Professor Gordon Reed, I'm so pleased that we get to spend some time with you. On Juneteenth is a gem. It was such a pleasure reading it because you beautifully combine memoir and history to give us a wonderful and compelling story about race, about the long road to Juneteenth, and most importantly, about the great state of Texas. So welcome. Glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Sure. Um, when I think of Texas, what immediately comes to my mind are oil, big ranches, <laughs> Cowboys, the Alamo, and Ted Cruz. Uh, yet in your book, you write, and I quote, Texas, more than any state in the union, has always embodied nearly every major aspect of the story of the United States of America. You write, it is the American story told from this most American place. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, I mean, Texas has it all, all of the kinds of things that have brought difficulties that America has struggled with within the confines of the state. There's westward expansion, um, the conflict with between native peoples and, and Europeans, plantation slavery, Jim Crow after the end of plantation slavery. It borders another country. So immigration is an issue. These are all things that it was a republic, its own republic, the sort of yearnings of a particular place to be its own nation. It's all there and it makes it a very, very volatile place, even though it seemed, seems to be exotic and sort of very different from the rest of America. But it has all of these components of America right there. Wow. So you write in a, just a little more about Texas. Um, you said um, that Texas is unique because, and I'm quoting, it shares a border with a foreign nation, mm -hmm. has a long history of disputes with Europeans and an indigenous population, and between Anglo-Europeans and people of Spanish origin, had existed as an independent nation that had plantation-based slavery and legalized Jim Crow. I mean, there's so much to unpack about Texan history, and I was stunned by so much of it. Um, I'm wondering, could you highlight a few historical facts about Texas that most of us likely don't know, but should definitely know? Well, I think Texas was a republic. I don't know that many people understand that for almost 10 years, Texas was its own nation, that it fought against Mexico for its freedom, and that it had a declaration of independence, Texas independence, and a constitution, declaration that sort of 
apes the uh, American Declaration of Independence, but it takes out the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and a constitution that was formed in 1836, and I'm sure people have probably heard of the new, maybe have heard of the new 1836 project that they have down in Texas now. Can you tell uh, us a little bit about that? Yes, I will, but it's okay. the idea is to foster patriotic education, people who are concerned about talking about race, talking about slavery and all of those kinds of things have determined that the Texas children should be given a patriotic education. But 1836 refers to the formation of the America, excuse me, of the Texas Republic. But the Texas Republic existed under a constitution that explicitly condoned slavery, a constitution that had provisions that said that African-American people could not become citizens of the Republic and that people couldn't free their uh, enslaved people without, you know, without permission. So I, I wonder how they're going to have this <laughs> to foster yeah. learning about Texas history without looking at the Constitution that, unlike the American Constitution that tries to, to hide slavery in a way by talking about persons held to service, the Texas Constitution is explicit about in its, uh, in, in its you know, condoning of slavery and promotion of it. So I think people, when they, just as you began by saying, you think of cowboys and oil and you know cattle ranches and those kinds of things. I don't think people really know the extent to which Texas was a slave society. East Texas, which you know, was the most populous part of the state, was home to plantations, very much like in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, all of those places. Texas's images image focuses on. West Texas, essentially, the least populous part of it. And even when you talk about cowboys, people don't know that there were black cowboys, that there were many of them. But the Hollywood image of Texas is of of white guys, you know, rolling around, on, you know, riding, riding around on the range and, you know, and doing, you know, bronco busting and things like that. Not don't think about the fact that Stephen F. Austin, who was who was considered the father of Texas, um, inherited from his father who, who had take, who'd gotten the right to bring Anglo settlers into Texas after his father died, he took, took up the cause and brought people there who brought enslaved people with the express idea that they would create a cotton empire built on slave labor and sugarcane as well, other crops that they grew. So I don't think people think about that aspect of it. So race, the whole problem with race that grew out of slavery when people hear about stuff going on in Texas, I think it puzzles them because it, they don't understand the origins of these, of these problems and these issues. Right. You know, I, I'd love in the book the way that you intertwined your own story with the story that builds up toward Juneteenth. So let, let's talk a little bit, if, if it's OK with you, about your upbringing in the town of Conroe, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could tell us about your parents Mm -hmm. um, how their views impacted your public school education that resulted in your integrating your town schools. And, and really, what kind of parents would have you do that? What was their thinking and, and what was the experience like for you? OK, well, I was born in a place called Livington, Livingston, Texas, which is about 50 miles northeast of Conroe. And my parents moved to Conroe when I was about six months old. My mother got a job teaching in um, teaching at, at Booker T. Washington, which was the black school in the community, K through 12. My father had a store and he had a, a, he did a number of things, uh, trying to be an entrepreneur at the time. And they moved to, to Conroe and with my two older brothers. And I went to the black school, we should call it, when I, I was in kindergarten. But by the time I was going to the first grade, Texas had come up with something called the Freedom of Choice Plan. And it wasn't just Texas. Other jurisdictions in the South had this, too. It was as a way of trying to get around the decision in Brown versus Board of Education. This is like 10 years after that. And under the Freedom of Choice Plan, people were supposed to white parents would choose white schools and black parents would choose black schools, sort of keeping with the traditions that had been in place and everybody was going to live according to those traditions. My parents decided 
that they were not going to choose the black school, that they would send me to a white school, Anderson Elementary School. And they made this decision. Well, and, and I've said this, that their rationale for doing that kind of changed over time as they became disillusioned with the effects of integration, disappointed by you know, whatever transformation that, that they thought was gonna happen didn't come to fruition, their reasons became more pragmatic. They'd say, well, you know, we sent you to the school because we knew that the court would eventually strike down freedom of choice plans, that it would be unconstitutional and everybody would have to change schools. And this is what they said later on. But thinking back to that time period and remembering how they talked about this, remembering how other people responded to this, I, it seems to me that their ideas, that they were more idealistic than they let on later on. It was almost as if in their disappointment, they did not want to admit <laughs> that they had been idealistic so it became a pragmatic decision. But if you, and this is great for historian, <laughs> thinking about letters and thinking about the past and how people portray things and how people's understandings about things sometimes legitimately change over time or they alter them. <laughs> you know, it, it becomes a different rationale in their mind. And they may think they have had it all along, but I, I think the evidence from the time period indicates that they were idealistic. This is, you know, 64, 65, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. We were in a moment, Black people and the country was, they were in a moment where people were marching and doing things that were supposed to advance the, the struggle of Black people. And sometimes I, I, I think, you know, I have two children and I wonder, would I have done that? You know, would I send my kids to now? My kids went to a school, a, a, actually a private school that, but it was predominantly white. But there were black people there. There were black teachers. It wasn't like my circumstance where I was the only black person there. I don't think the janitors were were black at Anderson. I don't recall any uh, at, at the time, and um, so they sent me to this school under, I think with idealism that they were a part of this movement. And the people around me, I, I tell a story in the book about one of our relatives who lived in Houston, who was very close to my mother. She, you know, my mother, had, she lived with my mother. My mother went to high school for a time in Houston and she lived with her there. And she went out to Sackowitz, which was for people who were, who were not from Houston. No, no, that was the sort of big ritzy department store at the time and bought way too many clothes. Uh, for me, and that was sort of her contribution. Everybody wanted this to work. And you, you think of everything, how you look, how you act, all of those kinds of things matter. So that's what I was sent into. Uh, they agreed with, um, I think among the a newspaper and the school district, they all agreed that no one would make a big deal about it, that I would just go. And so I wasn't, you know, I wasn't Ruby Bridges being escorted or the Little Rock Nine. It was nothing so dramatic as that. My father, uh, I didn't ride the bus. <laughs> there was a bus there, but I think that probably would have been just too much, tempting fate too much uh, to do that. Uh, my father took me to school, drove me to Anderson in the mornings, and I went to class. Mrs. Daughtry. Uh, was my first grade teacher. I get, we all, everybody remembers the name of their first right. grade teacher. Right. And she was just wonderful uh, to me. And my second grade teacher, Ms. Gilliland as well. Um, I, and I think in addition to being you know, good people, <laughs> I think, I wonder, and now after having written the book and thought about it, never thought about it until after this, that maybe the fact that my mother was a school teacher may have influenced them. That, you know, that that gave them a little extra reason to be uh, to be good to me because this a fellow teacher's child was here. So, you know, I I went it, it was supposed to be normal, but I knew it wasn't normal. You know, there were people who um, you know, would come to educators, I think, would come and stand in the doorway 
and look into the classroom. And I knew that I was being observed, that we were all being observed. This, you know, a black child here with you know, 20, 25 other white kids, how this was going. So I knew I was on display. Uh, and it, I, I, uh, I can't know because this was my experience. You know, this is the way my life was. And I sometimes wonder what is it like not to be on display? You know, how kids, because I know how kids can be very, very self-conscious, but from an early age, I had the feeling because it was true uh, that people were watching what I was doing. So, you know, uh, that's a lot, but I, I, I have to say, the, the teachers were wonderful. Some of the students were nice and some weren't. Yeah. And I think some people's parents may have told them to be nice to me, or maybe they decided on their own. Uh, but others, it was the opposite. So there was, there was normality with this weird abnormality, you know, mm -hmm. tied into this. I, it all worked for me because I loved school. You know, I love reading and I love to learn. And so the actual work that we were doing was pleasant to me. It was something that I liked, but there was this social overlay about integration that was always there that I was, you know, I was always aware of it. Yeah. So you, you write in the book that some black folks were offended uh, by this integration move. And you, you talk about one incident in particular where you were confronted. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, you know, I, after I went to Anderson, um, by cho my parents chose to do that. And I think the following year, another family sent their daughter. And this was someone who knew my, my father, I believe. And so they sent the daughter. And, and after, the second, after the first year, uh, she was there, but no one else did. But about three years after this, the Supreme Court uh, struck down uh, freedom of choice plans. And then everybody had to move. Everybody changed schools. And there was great resentment about that. Um, they lost something. Booker T. Washington was the center of the Black community in, in that town. The teachers were role models. They were the most respected people, you know, that and ministers, but they were the most respected people in the, in the town. And with integration, and this is another one of the reasons, a, a reason my parents, I think, and my mother in particular, became disillusioned about integration. They integrated the children, but not the teachers. Uh, all across the South, hmm. a number of teachers were replaced, were taken out of the classroom or put in places, you know, and, and doing teaching things that, they, that were not their normal subjects or were put in administration. White parents did not want, wary, did not want black teachers over their children. And so there was integration, but not integration in the set right. all, all over, just the children. So people resented that uh, to go to, you know, white schools, with teachers who might have been not as great as Mrs. Darchery and Mrs. Gillel and Mrs. Oaks, the people that I knew when I was at, at Anderson. Um, uh, so it was it was tough for them. And people were very hostile to me sometimes. I, I tell a story in the book about being in line uh, for you know, getting on the buses. There was a school next to us that the kids, everybody would assemble at Anderson to get on the buses to go home. And there was a boy who was in line. And he I remember him looking back and saying, that's her, meaning me. And then he just started punching me. This was a and black kid. He was black. black. Kid. He was yeah. bunch punching me in the chest. And it was just surreal because it, it didn't make any sense, you know, to me. I mean, no, nobody should hit anybody, but I didn't know who he was. You know, and that was my first inkling that there was some hostility towards me. And I had to sort of sort this out in my mind. You know, number one, why does he know me? Number two, why that's her? Why would he hit me, you know, repeatedly? And it was bewildering to me and until I figured out that this had to do with the fact that they, in their minds, I had been the cause of all of this. And of course, we know this was lawyers and the courts 
and everybody who come to the conclusion that this was a violation of Brown, but it wasn't my doing. Um, and so that was my first inkling that I was a problematic figure in the black community. I mean, I knew that there was hostility towards me by from whites, you know, and that had existed from the time I went to the school and with, with kids who, as I said, weren't some of them who weren't nice, but I hadn't fixated on the fact I didn't understand that there were black people who were upset about this because it meant the loss of their schools. I represented that loss and that's why he was hitting me. And, you know, throughout the years, periodically, there would be people who would want to fight me, want to beat me up. Again, I didn't know who they were, but I always understood what it was about, you know, what the, what the problem was. They'd heard their parents maybe talk about my family and talk about me. And um, that was, it was a source of, of great pain to them. I mean, that is, didn't justify him hitting me, but uh, and thinking back on it, that that's really, really what it was because they'd lost their role models. They'd lost something that they loved and was very valuable to them. Wow. And, you know, things have, have really changed since you integrated that school way back in the day, because today uh, there's a mural of you on a wall in downtown Conroe, and there is a bust of you in a nearby park. Mm -hmm. uh, are you pleased about all that? I mean, it's probably a, a no brainer question, I guess. <laughs> please, but, I mean, how, how do you feel about that? I mean, you don't reside in Texas now, mm -hmm. but I get a sense Texas is a part of you in, yes. in a good way. So, you know, how do you feel about all this now? Well, it feels great. I mean, the only thing that I wish is that my parents were alive to see these things and they're not, yeah. unfortunately. But um, it's it's a startling turn of events. The more I, I've you know, thought about this periodically over the years. And while I was uh, I was writing this book in the middle of the, the pandemic and we were sort of confined to our obviously confined to our apartment, pretty much. Um, I was cleaning out some boxes and I found an essay that I had written about this that could have been a Texas town, the chapter called A Texas Town, where I'm writing about this. I've totally forgotten about this. And this must have been years, years ago. I mean, it's courier type, you know, the print type. And so this is something that has been on my mind for a long time, evidently, of writing about and trying to work through. Uh, I'd probably put it away after, you know, the Hemings of Monticello and all of the stuff that happened with that. Uh, but it was interesting to find it. I mean, it's pretty much the same. Obviously, the, the factual things are, are pretty much the same. I think it's better. Mine is better written now. I, you know, I, I've, uh, it's a better chapter. A Texas Town is a better piece of writing than, than that was. But it was interesting to find it because it's been stored there in the back of my mind for many years and not dealing with it or thinking about it until I came to the decision to actually write this book. It's a, you know, it's, it's not a national story, but it's sort of, a, it's a big deal in that area to have done that. It was certainly a big deal for me and, and probably shaped me in ways that uh, I've, I've had to think about. Uh, and again, back to this question, you know, after you have my kids, after I had my kids, you know, what I, would I do that? And I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. It's tough. Um, I, I mean, I, my sense is you, you, I conclude your parents made the right decision in sending you to, to school. And I get why Texas is so much still a part of you, even though you're at Harvard. Um, and then I'm married to a, uh, to a Californian who would not, I would live in Texas again. You would, uh, but yes, yes. I love Houston. Um, but uh Spouse, no. <laughs> <laughs> Got to negotiate that one, right? Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, South, no. Got it. Uh, what, what makes your storytelling so rich is the fact that you're not only an historian, but you're also a lawyer. Um, and just really quickly, I mean, why did you go to law school? I went to law school because, well, my father <laughs> always admired lawyers. And I think if he'd had an opportunity in life to do that, that that's probably what he would have he would have wanted to do. So it was partly to please my father. It was partly because I knew that lawyers made a difference, could make a difference in the world. And 
again, this too, my the, my history is tied up in law. <laughs> you know, the story right. about the, the freedom of choice and desegregation and all those things. Lawyers were uh, people who could take action and change the world. And I thought that that's one way I could do that. And that's how I ended up doing it. I, you know, and, and there's a pragmatic thing. It's a way to make a living. You know, I thought that this was a way to make a living. And while I, while I sort of t- took the opportunity to try to make things better for people. So that's why I went to law school. Okay. I never thought that I would practice. I ended up going working in a firm for a time, but I actually thought that I would go and work be a government lawyer, maybe an administrative agency or something like that. But I, I wanted to, to help people. That's why I went to law school. Hmm. So as a result, your descriptions of court cases that impacted the lives of Black people in Texas, they're really riveting. And uh, one example is your telling of the 1940 case of Texas versus White mm-hmm. that went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. So if I can, I, I'd like to just set the stage and t- you know, tell everyone how the court ruled. And then I'd like you to tell how the court ruled and, and what happened afterwards. So okay. that's OK. I just want to set the stage. So um, Bob White, a black man, had been accused of raping a white woman in Livingston, Texas. That's where you were born. Mm-hmm. Uh, the woman was unable to identify him as the racist, as, as the rapist, excuse me, to identify him as the rapist after viewing 15 black men rounded up by law enforcement but did ID Mr. White after the cops told him to say the words that the woman attributed to her assailant. So he was arrested, he was jailed, and he was taken by the Texas Rangers every night for a week, chained to a tree and beaten until he signed a confession, even though he couldn't read or write and he had no lawyer. So a jury convicted him and imposed the death sentence. He appealed, was granted a new trial that was moved to Conroe, where you were subsequently raised. Mm -hmm. He was again convicted. And this time the appeal goes to the U.S. Supreme Court. So could you take it from there? Mm -hmm. And the court rules that taking somebody outside, (laughs) tying them to the tree and whipping them until they confess was a violation of the due process clause. And they send the case back down. And this is fascinating because I teach criminal procedure and we do confessions. And the case that I use is Brown versus Mississippi. And that involved more than one person, but it was a similar thing, you know, taking them out, tying them to, there's something about tying them to a tree and whipping them. And the court says that this is a violation of the due process clause. I did not know that this case had gone to the Supreme Court. My grandfather used to talk about Bob White when I was a little girl. And so I knew about Bob White. He knew Bob White. He knew the Cochran's. Um, the woman that Bob White allegedly raped and the husband of the woman called Dude Cochran. And so the case goes back down for trial. While it's going on, Dude Cochran comes into the courthouse and shoots Bob White in the back of the head, killing him instantly, hands the gun to some official there. He's later tried for this and acquitted in just a few minutes and the courtroom erupts in applause. So here's a situation where a person had premeditated murder, shot someone in front of a judge, a jury, police officers, sheriffs, um, dozens and dozen packed courthouse, and he gets off. And this really breaks the spirit of people because you know Conroe, there've been lynchings in Conroe and other places. I mean, you know, Conroe has a reputation for being hard place for race, but there are other places too. But um, this was different, I think. And I, this is just, this is my speculation about why this galvanized people so much because, you know, lynch mob, there was a guy who was burned at the stake, a man who was burned at the stake on the courthouse square in, in Conroe about 12 years before all this happened, 12, 15 years before this happened. So they were used, and other lynchings as well. They were used to, you don't get used to lynchings, but they understood that happened. This was different because I imagine that people's hopes were raised because procedurally, you know, there were people who were protesting this. You know, it it was going up and he'd had a new trial and got to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, you can't do this and send it back down. So that people may have thought that the system of justice might actually work 
But then to have him killed in this way and have nothing happen to his assailant was just really, really rough for people. There are people in my family who refused to spend the night in Conroe. I mean, they would come to visit, <laughs> but then they would go. And I don't know that it was just because they were scared. I think it was almost like a protest that they didn't want to, you know, spend the night in a place where something like that could happen. So this is, you know, this happened, you know, as we we're saying in the late 30s, trials, 1940, you know, 25 years later, you know, there, you know, I'm going to, and it, it's a blink of an eye <laughs> in terms between that event and what happened to me in the mid 60s. And you can't, the purpose of the, the chapter, the things that I'm talking about is that you know, these kinds of things seep into the culture, a cultural memory to the way people do things in a society. And you don't, you can't just erase that. <laughs> I mean, law can be pronounced, law can be changed, but on the ground, the culture and mores and traditions and attitudes can persist. You know, we went, to, as I said, they were fighting Brown for many years. When I was a kid, we went to separate, you know, waiting rooms at, at the local clinic. Uh, when I went to the movies, we sat in the balcony. And some of those things lasted even after it was probably illegal to do these things. But in a town where, with a memory, a cultural embedded memory about violence, and the, and the possibility of violence that will not be punished, I think it affected everybody. You know, even the things are against the law. It's, it, you know, traditions and cultural memories and understandings die hard. So it, it had this reputation um, because of all of the things that happened there and the atmosphere. Now, having said that, people may be surprised to hear me say that I thought I had a happy childhood. I had a good time growing up. I mean, we rode bikes. We, you know, when the summer came, when school was out, take your shoes off. That's it until, <laughs> until you go to church or go into town or something like that. And I had, I had a good childhood because my parents, you know, cared about me and I had my brothers and my grand, I mean, there were, I took piano lessons. I did all the kinds of things that kids do. And, but, there was this tension because of the racial situation that you knew that at any moment, you know, if you got too far out of line or anybody else got too far out of line, that it can be a real problem there. So it's hard to explain to the South and, and this part of Texas is the South um, to people who don't, who don't live there, that how you can have happiness <laughs> and a sense of peace, but at the same time, there at the back of your, you know, back of your mind, you can understand that this could all go awry uh, with a spark. Right. Um, so as we move toward Juneteenth discussion, I, I, I wanna talk about documents. And um, the first one um, I wanna talk about, ask you to talk about is, the Texas Declaration of Independence. So you write in your book, I often encounter great hesitancy about and impatience with discussing race when talking about American past. Mm -hmm. The obvious difficulty with those kinds of complaints is that people in the past, in the overall American context and the specific context of Texas, talked a lot about and did a lot about race. Mm -hmm. It isn't some newly discovered fad topic. Race is right there in the documents, official and personal. And you conclude it would take a concerted effort not to consider and analyze the subject. Mm -hmm. So the Texas Declaration of Independence. Um, talk to us about that and mm -hmm. why that is significant. Well, they wanted to <clears throat> sort of imitate what had happened in the United States and that wanted to with the formation of the United States, to have a, a statement as to why they wanted to break away from Mexico, what right they had to break away from Mexico. And so it follows the form of, that Jefferson chose 
for the American Declaration. Um, it lists, it starts off talking about, you know, the, the difficulty that they had with the Mexican government and then lists grievances, just like the American Declaration, the part that nobody reads because it's not really applicable anymore, but listing all of the things that the king has done, the, the reason that they're going to go. But it curiously leaves out, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And the, the words that we value and the words that have been considered to be the American creed and that people around the world, you know, social movements around the world have looked to, you know, to, to make statements about their right to self-determination. Um, they don't include it because they see that evidently, and, and certainly the Confederacy, when we get to the Confederacy, they say this, they repudiate that idea that all men are created equal. Uh, and didn't understand, didn't want it a part of it because they understood that it gave people ideas. People knew this. I mean, they, I mean, people understood, you know, African-American people understood they were human beings and believed that they were equal human beings before Jefferson put those words in the declaration. But those words had influenced people and might influence people and even, even further influence them to action. So they don't put that in there. And you know, for, as I said, for obvious reasons, their constitution, as I mentioned, talks specifically about slavery and talks about race. So that's, it's just a little bit hard for me to understand how you're going to talk about the Texas Republic without talking about their, con about its constitution. And, you know, it's tough because as a kid, we're raised we take Texas history in the fourth grade and the seventh grade, and apparently you can take it as an elective when you're in, in high school. So, you know, you could have three years of Texas history, and some people say that might be just a bit much um, for state history, but the, not in, depends on how you teach it, because obviously Texas as an entity, there was a national debate about bringing Texas into the union because it was a slaveholders republic. Uh, internationally, it was seen as something of a pariah because of its uh, the republic's blatant, you know, support and and uh, you know, taking up slavery as as an institution. There was one thing to talk about persons held to service, and slavery is a necessary evil. There was none of that here. This is, you know, ball faced, you know, embrace of the institution. So, you know. Those documents that are important to us, and, and we once we know what you know the absence in the declaration, the Texas Declaration about equality, and you look at the Constitution, you have to talk about race. <laughs> you know, you have to, this is there. And on, as I said, you would really have to be avoiding things, gonna redact those provisions and not notice that the most famous words in the declaration are not in the Texas Declaration it invites discussions about race. And so I really, I'm interested to see what people are gonna do with this, with Project 1836 and you know, in, in the future. Is, is it fair to assume that when you studied Texas history, when you were in school, fourth grade, seventh grade, and maybe high school, that when you talked about the Texas Declaration of Independence, you did not talk about the fact that the all created equal language was not in it? Excuse me. No, we did not talk about that. And we didn't, I don't recall talking that much about the constitution. It was, I knew that they had one, <laughs> but I don't remember going point by point through it because if, if we had, I certainly would have paused over that, or, you know, over the fact of the, the acceptance of slavery and black people can't live there without permission and they can't be um, can't be citizens. So there were things like that were not I don't recall them being raised. Now, I have I suspect and I haven't done a survey of this, but I would suspect. I mean, I know I, just because, well, it's, it's better now, <laughs> I, I can imagine that the kinds of things people talk about today are much broader and much more, much more inclusive history. And maybe that's part of the reaction 
you know, why we have these moves, not just in Texas. I don't want to single Texas out only. It's because, but it's a big state and people pay attention to it. But in other states as well, there is a reaction to a more inclusive, a more, and they would say critical history uh, in different places because, you know, this notion of patriotic education, which people define or seem to be defining as only talking about things that make us happy or make us proud, uh, this effort is in lots of different places. And it's something that I think, you know, we have to kind of push back, at, not kind of, we have to push back against because there's no benefit in hiding things from people. And the things that I'm talking about are not, um, they're not, hidden. It's not a matter of interpretation. As I said, they're right there in the documents. Yeah. And it would be doing a disservice to students if you did not acknowledge that. Yeah, it, it, it's absolutely startling, the, the information that's that's in these documents. So let's get now to June 19th, 1865. Mm -hmm. You have Gordon Granger, a general in the U.S. Army, arrives in Galveston, Texas, and he's carrying with him General Order Number Three, and because of your book, this was the first time I read General Order Number Three, which is just four sentences. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like you to uh, talk to us about the immediate and long-term impact on Texans of all hues about this order, and I'm just going to read the four sentences. General Order Number Three: The people of Texas are informed that, in accordance with a proclamation from the Executive of the United States, meaning the President. All slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves, and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. The free men are advised to remain at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and they will not be supported in idleness, either there or elsewhere. So talk to us about this order. Well, a Granger, one of the Granger comes to Louis, comes from Louisiana to Texas. And one of the first thing he does is to, to write this. And there are different statements about how it was made known to people. The traditional story is that he read those words from the balcony of the villa where he was staying. And some people say that his soldiers went around Galveston, which was the major city in Texas at the time. We think of it as Houston today, but it was Galveston was the big deal then um, and read it. It may be he probably did both. <laughs> you know, he could have done, done both. But the truth is people knew some people knew before he got there what he was intending to say, what was going to happen. This was a couple of weeks after the army of the Trans-Mississippi had surrendered. Most people think the Civil War is over when Lee surrenders at Appomattox in April, but people kept fighting in the Southwest. And that's why things were delayed um, in, in Texas um, because there was a battle. The, the, the United States did not take over that particular territory they, you know, until they surrendered. Um, so he makes this pronouncement. Enslaved people are jubilant, very happy about this. And the whites are not so happy about it. There are stories about people who were whipped when they celebrated uh, Juneteenth, uh, celebrated, the, not it wasn't Juneteenth then, but celebrated the news of emancipation, but they kept doing it anyway. And over the years, there were celebrations at people's homes, at churches, and so forth. The Freedmen's Bureau uh, sponsored some, uh, some Juneteenth celebrations as well. In 1876, some men in Houston pooled their resources, some Black men in Houston uh, pooled their resources and bought land for the specific purposes of hosting Juneteenth celebrations, people would come and give speeches, sing songs, make food, uh, and you know talk about what had happened, remember what had happened, and and that eventually became Emancipation Park, which is still 
in Houston today where I have been to Juneteenth celebrations uh, as, as a kid when we weren't celebrating at home or at my grandmother's house. So this was a day of, some people claim that this is the longest continuous celebration of emancipation. Emancipation was a process. It took place over time. Uh, but this instance of emancipation, the, the longest continuous one in the country. Now, there are people who dispute that. People in Boston say, yes, we've been celebrating Emancipation Day on January 1st as well. There's no need to get into a, a battle about that. But the point is that it has been continuous. And in the last, it became a state holiday in Texas in 1979, the first official celebration of it in 1980. And now it's gotten bigger and bigger. The last couple of years has just been amazing the amount of attention that has been given to Juneteenth. And that's why there's this push. Well, there was a push before this, but now even a greater push to have it as a national holiday. All from you this statement, you know, that it's pretty extraordinary. I mean, one thing I, I meant to say about it is that the second sentence that, well, the first sentence that talks about absolute equality, which didn't have to be there. He could have just said, you know, slavery's over, you know, stay here, work for wages and leave it at that. But this notion of absolute equality in rights and property rights and so forth, um, you know, that's that's a that links itself to the Emancipation Proclamation, which obviously is Lincoln, one of Lincoln's last acts. And Lincoln used the Declaration of Independence in this notion of equality, both in the Gettysburg Address and in talking about the Emancipation of Proclamation, um, linking all of these documents together, making equality a sort of central tenet of American, of American life. Did, did Granger actually author the general yes. order? Yes. So these were his words he chose yeah. to use. Mm. Just to say these things. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, what do you make of his comment about, uh, but black folks are free, but don't be idle? Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm thinking he's he has an audience here. He's not just talking to enslaved people. He's talking to white people, too. And I think he, he's making the announcements that, you know, they're going to work <laughs> and we're not going to support them if they don't work, essentially. So I, I, that's the only thing that I could figure. We This is kind of it raises our hackles because, you know, the story, the thought of, Black people being lazy, idleness. You know, these are people who are who are made to work, you know, sun up to sun down for nothing to talk about idleness. But I, I really I suspect that that's a message to them. There have been complaints about people, you know, enslaved people running to to regiments and you know glomming on to reg regiments uh, of the army. Uh, but I I suspect it was also a message to white people as well that these people are going to work. Don't. You know, don't be up. Don't worry. Uh, they will stay there. They'll work for wages. Uh, but that's not he says advised. And a lot of people didn't take that advice. They went around looking for their parents and looking for their siblings and people whom they lost right. in slavery. There was also another message to white folks is that you're going to pay them for their labor. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. that was quite clear. Mm -hmm. um, so th there there is, as, as you noted, a move afoot in Texas to pass laws to reframe Texas history lessons and play down references to slavery and anti-Mexican discrimination in public school classrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, but more specifically, there are bills to ban or limit the role of slavery and the impact of racism that can be taught in the schools. So a law has already passed. Um, the House that would limit teacher led discussions of current events, prohibit course credit for political activism or lobbying, including volunteering for civil rights groups and ban teaching of the 1619 project. Um, another proposed law would create a committee to promote um, patriotic education about the state's secession from Mexico in 1836, that's the project, and limit how teachers can discuss the ways in which racism influences the legal system in Texas. Another would block exhibits at the Alamo from explaining the major figures in the Texas Revolution were slave owners. So uh, what's going on? I mean, it does sound like revisionist history on steroids and not just in Texas. It's happening in Idaho, Louisiana, New Hampshire and Tennessee. So talk to what, what is this and, and what is to be done? Well, it's people don't want to be made to feel bad about things that they people who they think 
People don't want to be made to feel bad about things that people whom they consider to be their ancestors did. Right. They see it as a reflection. You're saying that we're bad people because you're mentioning these things, but they did these things. These things happen. Nobody's making anything up. Nobody's pretending that there was slavery in Texas when there wasn't. Nobody's pretending that there was not a conflict with Mexico over the issue of slavery. Uh, there were other issues, other reasons why they separated, but that was one of them. That was clearly one of the things that was galvanizing them. So it's misplaced guilt. You know, we want, they want to, to think of people in the past. And when they say people in the past, they mean people to whom they, with whom they identify to be seen as uniformly good people, having done uniformly good things. And the extent to which you talk about slavery and race and discrimination against Mexican-Americans, all those kinds of things, you're saying that their great, great, great grandparents did bad stuff. Well, the truth is they did. You know, I mean, there's no way around that. Yeah. What you have to do is to, you could easily say, yes, you know, they made mistakes. They had some good things they did, but they made mistakes. And we're going to go forward from that. But this is an effort to say, no, no mistakes were made. <laughs> there were no problems. And you can't do that without denying the history and the heritage of, say, my family. You know, am I supposed to pretend that my great, great, great grandparents were not enslaved? Am I supposed to say that that was an OK thing? You know, it's yeah. it's really uh, well, it's unrealistic. And I think it's out of it's a reaction. It's out of fear. Yeah. You know, the, the corollary to that is that black folks don't like to hear that there were um, Africans who were actually involved in the slave trade. Yeah. That, you know, we don't want to hear we don't want to talk about it, but it's a fact. It is. A fact. It is the truth. And mm -hmm. it makes us very uncomfortable to think that there are those of us who are beginnings mm -hmm. in Africa were the bad, the bad people enslaving mm -hmm. other people and also yeah. helping mm -hmm. the slave trade. Same, yeah. same kind and, of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, and thinking and sort of grafting onto them, the people who were sellers, like well, they're selling your own people. Well, they didn't think they were own people. These are people that they were at war with. That's how slavery in the world has progressed. Usually the way it, it, it typically happens is that people are defeated in battle. And because you weren't killed in battle, which they could have done, they say, we're going to keep you as slaves. And that's one of the things that happened. So it's yep. not that this notion of our people comes from Europeans. I mean, they were the ones who created you're black <laughs> and the people over there, they didn't black. What is that? You know, what does that mean? You don't think about blackness in a place where everybody's black. We've accepted um, the sort of norms about dividing people into race. And so when people say they sold their own people, they didn't think they were their own people. They spoke a different language, may have had a different religion, a different culture. It's, it's Europeans who divide people, who had divided people up into these notions of race based upon their skin color. Um, you describe yourself as a historian of slavery, and I'm incorporating this into a question from uh, some of our uh, people in attendance here. And the question is, what made you become interested in studying and becoming a historian? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the experiences that I've been talking about today, as a kid, wondering why, what's the big deal about a black person going to school with white kids? Why does the store proprietor, when I go into his store, when black people go into a store, why is he automatically, reflexively nasty to them? people who hadn't done anything to him. Why, why doesn't he, why does he hate us? You know, what have I done to make someone feel that way about me and hadn't done anything to this person? And I think from that question, those kinds of questions, I was seeking answers. And when I learned about slavery, more about slavery, learning that slavery was racially based, I began to think about the connections between the past and the present. And so I, th I think it naturally led me to the racial situation in my town, my experiences with it naturally led me to history to try to figure all of this out. 
Interesting. Um, we have another question. Is there a place in Texas that you encourage everyone to visit at least once or learn about aside from your mural and your bust <laughs> in the park? Well, you know, I think I would go to, to Houston. Uh, I would, I think just riding around Houston, getting a sense of the size of, of the place and the different neighborhoods and the different communities uh, I think that that's San Jacinto Monument would be a good place to go. You know, I have not been to the Alamo. Mm. I was so hoping that things would be open <laughs> uh, by the time this, this tour came about that I could go there and, and, uh, and see it. I think just riding around the forest of Texas, I mean, you know, to get a sense of the size of it and the big in there in the big thicket where, Livingston is, and Conroe is sort of at the edge of it, uh, to see the diversity of the nature of the place. I love driving around in that area and, and seeing, you know, seeing what most people think of Texas as the desert. And this is the exact opposite of all of that. I think the scenery is gorgeous. How, how do you observe Juneteenth today? Well, you know, I live in an apartment, so I can't barbecue. <laughs> And if you don't have the wood for it either, um, anyway, up here, um, you know, I, I, I try to get drink red soda water. <laughs> I try to have that. We usually purchase barbecue, barbecue brisket. Um, and it's just a way to talk about, you know, I look at pictures. I talked to, I've talked to my kids about this and when they were living here with us and just remembering you're just thinking about this these these days, and and I have a feeling. Well, I know what I'm going to be doing this June 19th. I'm going to be talking to people uh, all day, pretty much. Uh, but it's more food related, you know. It's more doing the not the goat, but the the soul food and the red soda water, and thinking about my family. Yeah, I uh, recently watched um, a Netflix documentary four part called High on the Hog. Mm -hmm. And it's about African-American cuisine. And there's, and there's a wonderful section of it that talks about Texas and about barbecue mm -hmm. and Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, I, I encourage folks, if you're interested in this and want to learn talks more. about Monticello too. Oh, yes. Yes. And it's just, it's just terrific. I mean, I, it was a real eye-opening eye experience. And, and another way to spend Juneteenth is obviously is, is reading your book is really <laughs> read. No, I, I mean it seriously because it's just a wonderful context in which to place all of this. Um, how do you feel about it possibly becoming a national holiday? I mean, it's something that happened in Texas. Well, I think it's a good idea. You know, I think there should be a day to commemorate emancipation, um, which was not just an event in black people's lives. It was an event in the lives of the country, an event in the lives of the world uh, that, and as I said, emancipation took in, in phases. You know, there was not any one day. A lot of enslaved people emancipated themselves <laughs> by running away from plantations, running north and establishing lives for themselves. The Emancipation Proclamation was a step in the process. And as the lawyer, I, I talk about the, the end of, I think of the end of, uh, of the ratification of uh, the 13th Amendment at the end of 1865 is a, is a possible date. But I do think that June 19th is, is a good one. And, you know, we, it's, it's not perfect for everything because it did happen in Texas and there were still some places where there was legal slavery. And we don't get that until the end of the 13th Amendment, as I said. But this has caught on with people. You know, just last year, I just noticed just a proliferation, an explosion of interest in it and corporations and, you know, universities like Harvard have given it, made it a holiday for their workers and their staff and so forth. So I just think that this would be the natural end of this of this process. And I would hope that the day would bring uh, an impetus for education that it wouldn't just be a day of red soda water and barbecue, but a time when people you know, learned about, were taught about emancipation and, and the struggle that came afterwards. Because I think it's, it's backward looking in some ways, it's commemoration, we're looking to the past, but I think the people who actually were in those, in that time were thinking about the future, what they had to do next. 
And that's a meaningful message, I think, for us as well, not just about the past, but what we have to do next. So it's not just a black folks holiday. Oh, no, or no it's, not just about, it's not just a black people's holiday. Okay. Not at all. Got it. So we're coming up to the end of our hour together. And um, again, I, I just think uh, your work is terrific and your writing is just off the chain. It's just fabulous. So I, I, I'd like to conclude our conversation uh, with your reading to us the final paragraph of on Juneteenth, the very last thing. And I think it's a perfect way to, to wrap things up. Okay, thank you. Sure. About the difficulties of Texas. Love does not require taking an uncritical stance toward the object of one's affections. In truth, it often requires the opposite. We can't be a real surface to the ho- service to the hopes we have for places and people ourselves included, without a clear-eyed assessment of their and our strengths and weaknesses. That often demands a willingness to be critical, sometimes deeply so. How that is done matters, of course. Striking the right balance can be exceedingly hard. I hope I've achieved the proper equilibrium. Annette Gordon-Reed, you have not only achieved the proper equilibrium, you have done so with grace with beauty, with wit, and with love. And I thank you for all of your good work. And I thank you for writing on Juneteenth. Thank you very much. It was my privilege being here with you. It's fantastic. We encourage all of you to purchase your copy of Annette's new book on Juneteenth at your local bookstore. And if you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club efforts, please visit commonwealthclub.org. I am Ladaris Cordell. Thank you. And see you next time. Bye-bye.